how far you go and how much you grow is not just determined by what you believe about God. It is equally impacted by what you believe about you. I'm going to say that one more time. How far you go and how much you grow is not just determined by what you believe about God. It is equally impacted by what you believe about you. A sage named Solomon framed it this way in a book of the Bible called Proverbs. Solomon says this, as a man or woman thinks in their heart, so is he. Notice now, notice what Solomon did not say. He did not say as a man, watch this, or excuse me, as God thinks about a man or a woman, so is he. He says as a, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, you will always behave in a way that is consistent with how you see yourself. Meaning there, it is possible for there to be some inconsistency, some dissonance, a gap between what God thinks about you and what you think about yourself. And what God is attempting to do on our journey of spiritual growth is align what he thinks about us with what we think about ourselves so we can behave in a way that is consistent with what he thinks about us and not just what we think about what we think about ourselves. And this may be the reason that God regularly and repeatedly and consistently all throughout scripture reminds us of who we are. When you really go from Old Testament to New Testament, it seems a bit excessive. You will see God regularly and repeatedly telling you who you are. Salt, light, royal, Chosen, peculiar, beloved, special, anointed, head, not tail, above only, not beneath. Am I making sense? So if I am that, why does he have to keep telling me that? Because he knows who I am is my truth. That's his truth. But his truth isn't always my experience. So he says, that's who you are. That's truth. That's that's truth. That's what I know. But it doesn't become what you experience until you believe it. If I'm making sense, say yes. Yes. And, 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 And what I want us to see here when we get this revelation, it should cause a revolution because when the enemy cannot change what you think about God, his next step is to try to change what you think about you. But I've got good news, Elevation. I said, I've got good news, Elevation. They would say it this way in the church I grew up in, the devil is a liar. No, no, this is what that means. It doesn't mean he just doesn't tell the truth. It means he can't tell the truth. Jesus said the truth is not even in him which means whatever he is telling you about you can't be true. So instead of panicking based on what he's telling you about you, you ought to start praising based on what he's telling you about you because whatever he is telling you, the very opposite is true. And so if he's telling you you're not going to make it, you're getting ready to make it. If he's telling you you're not coming out, you're getting ready to come out. If he's telling you it's over, it's just beginning. And I want to know, is there anybody online, anybody at the locations that will just pause and give God a praise because the devil is a liar. He's a liar. And one of the things he wants to lie 
to us about is our identity. There's this, there's this, some embrace it, some don't. It's this principle of biblical interpretation. We would call it a hermeneutic. It's, it's called the law of first mention, which means that, that very often, specifically in the book of Genesis, if you see something mentioned for the first time, that might be a picture, picture or a pattern of how that thing's going to be seen throughout the thread of scripture. And when we see the enemy's interaction with the human species for the very first time, what did he try to create? He tried to create an identity crisis. When he is engaged, watch this, remember? So, so whether this is literal, literal or metaphorical, this is what's happening. In the garden, there is a snake. And why, why, is, why is the snake significant in the garden? It's significant because you wouldn't be surprised to see a snake in one. Because sometimes the devil shows up looking like he belongs. Right? So he's, he, he's engaging in conversation with Eve, right? And telling Adam and Eve, listen, no, 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 it's okay. You, you, can, you can eat that. You can eat that. And this is what he says. He says, he says, God knows if you eat that, you'll be like him. That's what he said, right? God knows if you eat that, you'll be like him. Well, you see this, this engagement happening in Genesis 3. But you go all the way back to Genesis 1, you'll see when God's having a conversation about creation, he says, let us make man in our image and likeness. So Satan tells Eve, God knows if you eat that, you'll be like him. But in Genesis 1, when he created Adam and Eve, he created them in his image and likeness. They weren't God, but they were like God in some ways. So she's trying to become what she already is. Did you hear what I just said? I said she's trying to become what she already is because what the enemy does is he can't take your worth, but he can take your awareness of it. He can't take your value, but he can take your vision. He can't take your gift, but he can take your grit. But I just believe. I just feel something in this room and in your living room and at every location. I believe there are some people that are getting ready to make an exit and an exodus out of your identity crisis. And you're going to start saying to yourself, I am who he says I am. I'm blessed not cursed. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above only, not beneath. I'm not just a conqueror. We don't just barely conquer. I'm more than a conqueror. I don't just survive. I thrive. Who am I preaching to today? And it's an identity crisis. And one of the ways he orchestrates this Man, I've seen this. I've been, I've been seeing this so much recently. One of the ways he orchestrates this is by infecting us. Infecting us. Watch this. With inadequacy. Can we just talk? We family. Y'all my cousin, right? Okay. So, so this is, I want to say this. Let's talk. The same enemy that orchestrates arrogance is the same one that orchestrates inadequacy. But in a lot of our religious spaces, the emphasis is on arrogance. There is an obsession with arresting and addressing arrogance. Be humble. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and, and in due season, he will exalt you. That's important. That's necessary. It's not incorrect. But if that's all we address, it's incomplete. Because in some ways, the enemy is working, attempting to cause people to think too highly of themselves. But then in other ways, the enemy is working, causing people to think too low of themselves. 
And I am telling you that, watch this, that inadequacy has assassinated just as many assignments as arrogance has. That the devil uses inadequacy just as much as he uses arrogance. As a matter of fact, very often when we see people being called to do something significant in scripture before they accept the assignment, God has to talk them out of inadequacy. It's all throughout scripture. See, just because you aren't thinking low about yourself doesn't mean you're thinking right. He called Moses. Moses responds with inadequacy. He says, Moses, I'm going to use you. You're going to go back to Pharaoh and you're going to be a leader. And you're going to lead people out of a place and a space and a state that's inconsistent with my intention for their life. And Moses is like, wait a minute, time out. Hold up. Flag on the play. Wait a minute. I don't, you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go before Pharaoh and speak. No, I'm a background person. <laughs> says, you're calling me to do something that is, that, watch this, that's in the exact area I feel inadequate in. He say, I'm slow with speech. I don't do that speaking thing. Moses is like, I can't do this without you. And God's like, exactly. That's why I picked you. Because you know you can't do this without me. And you will never try to do this without me. What you feel like is inadequacy, Moses. It's actually insurance, Moses. It's insurance because now I'm insured or assured that you're always going to lean on me, depend on me, trust me, look to me, consult me. He called Moses. Moses' inadequacy responded. When he called a gentleman named Jeremiah, Jeremiah responded with inadequacy. He said, I can't do this. I'm but a youth. I don't have the experience. And we could take that same text. And though Jeremiah talk, talks about how young he is, we could take that text and just apply it generally to something called age in general. And some people would say, I'm too old. It's too late. He's calling him to do something. And, he's, and Jeremiah is using his age as a limitation, inadequacy. He calls Gideon. Gideon uses his family. He said, do you know who my um, cousin is? <laughs> so you have generations of people who are waiting on them to unleash what God put in them. And because the enemy cannot ungift them, he arrests their ability to use their gift by causing them not to see the value of what God has put on the inside of them. But I came today to be a matchmaker and I'm not talking about Christian Mingo. I came to be a matchmaker to hook you up, not with somebody else, but to hook you up with you. I want to introduce you to a you you hadn't met yet. A stronger you, a wiser you, a more courageous you. There's some things on the inside of you that God wants to unleash and unlock but he wants us to cultivate not arrogance but confidence in the way you've been wired and how you've been crafted 